All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And uh, we're talking today about vascular tumors. And uh, there's a quite a few of these out there. We're going to look at about maybe 10 or 12 of these today. These, these are not absolutely crucial um, that uh, you become a vascular neoplasm expert. So you really just kind of need to know the, the most important ones. Uh, there might be a couple in here that uh, uh, I didn't include, but we've got a uh, pretty good representation of most of them. And there's some, some pretty good teaching points about these that, that we'll go through. And uh, the first one we're going to look at is, is a fairly common one, pyogenic granuloma. Uh, you see it's a shave biopsy here that we have. And it's, of course, we've got a couple of artifactual areas here. But this is really very typical of what we see with the pyogenic granuloma. They're usually uh, clinically reddish. Um, crusted lesions that are often sent in to rule out like basal cell or, or possibly like a vascular lesion. And often seen on the uh, extremities of young individuals. And when you look at them in higher magnification, they're in the family of what we call the lobular capillary proliferations. So basically what that means is that you get these lobules of capillaries that proliferate like you see here with uh, all this inflammation and crusting uh, associated with it. And the lobular capillary proliferation, there's several entities that can give you this basic pattern that we're looking at right here. We got these lobules of, of small capillaries that are proliferative here. Um, and things like uh, this lesion, just garden variety granulation tissue can do this. Um, when you look at uh, things like bacillary angiomatosis, uh, or Peruga varroana associated with the bartonellosis that occurs down in South, Af uh, South America and Central America. Those also will give you this lobular proliferation of these capillaries. So it's a, it's a reaction pattern that can be seen in, in a lot of different entities. So you need to be able to recognize that. It's benign. Notice there's no mitotic figures. There's no atypicality. There's no staghorn irregular blood vessels. There's no atypical endothelial cells floating freely in the lumen of any of these blood vessels here. Um, there's no promontory sign where you have a normal blood vessel surrounded by these jagged irregular three, uh, blood vessels that are neoplastic that you see in Kaposi sarcoma. So this is uh, a, a typical reaction pattern that you should be able to recognize with pyogenic granuloma. And these often will have uh, kind of an edematous stroma to them. Um, you may get some inflammation between some of the blood vessels, but not generally a lot of neutrophils in a, in a fairly dense pattern like we see, for example, in uh, bacillary angiomatosis. You may get a few neutrophils here, but not as many as we see in, in bacillary angiomatosis. And you don't get any of that pink amorphous material that correlates with the uh, warth and starry staining positive microorganisms in bacillary angiomatosis. So this is pyogenic granuloma. One other thing about PG, um, you have to remember that sometimes amelanotic malignant melanoma can clinically look like a pyogenic granuloma. And one other thing about pyogenic granuloma. If you um, biopsy a lesion, say, of Kaposi sarcoma that's on uh, the, say, the sole or the toe or something like that of an individual, you can get the KS part beneath and a PG-like morphology on the top. And if you don't sample the deep part, you can get an erroneous diagnosis. So uh, just remember that. One other thing in the differential of PG clinically uh, and sometimes histologically um, is a very vascular metastatic renal cell carcinoma. I've, I've seen a couple of those where they get traumatized or on the scalp, those lesions are very vascular, and then the, the trauma elicits a granulation tissue reaction, and then it can be, can be missed. So you can have a vascular neoplasm, either capuches or rarely angiosarcoma, but maybe a, a vascular metastatic renal cell carcinoma that gets traumatized, and then you get a granulation tissue reaction that can uh, basically uh, cause a, a misdiagnosis can be elusive in the diagnosis. Just always remember that uh, when neoplasms are inflamed or they're uh, basically become traumatized in some way, the trauma and the inflammation can, can basically simulate and uh, cause you to be able to not see the underlying neoplasm. Here's another lesion. Um, and this is uh, a lot of real dilated blood vessels here, a lot of extravasated erythrocytes. When you first look at this thing, it almost looks like it, you can't even see any vascular channels. If you look carefully, you can see that there's some residual blood vessels over here. There's a little bit of thrombosis of some of these here. This is probably a uh, just a 
garden variety cherry angioma or, or superficial capillary hemangioma that's been traumatized with some uh, fibrin in the blood vessels and then a little bit of residual extravasation of erythrocytes and possibly even some organization here. So this is a, a capillary hemangioma here that's been traumatized with all these extravasated red cells and probably some fibrin at the sites of where some of these blood vessels were, were traumatized. So this, uh, we often see these and, and, and clinicians may not even biopsy them unless they've been traumatized, something like this. So when they haven't traumatized like that, they're a little more challenging. When we just see these, uh, we, you know, I've got a couple of these coming up here in a couple of minutes that are more characteristic where you don't have all the inflammation and the extravasated erythrocytes. Uh, and those who just see a lot of small blood vessel channels that are lined by thin endothelial cells, when they're traumatized with something like this, uh, it can become more of a challenge. And so you see this uh, epidermis is necrotic up here. It's, it's probably been scratched or, or somehow otherwise traumatized. So that's an example of a traumatized uh, hemangioma. Now this one, uh, again, this one's a little bit more kind of characteristic. You can see the lesion itself is very small a little pedunculated. I'm, I'm not sure it might have been oriented like this. It, it actually might be, let's turn it over on its side. It, it's possible it could have been oriented like this. Um, but this is another example of an hemangioma. And it's just got uh, these, again, small blood vessels that are lined by thin endothelial cells. It's also got a little bit of a capillary, a little uh, uh, lobular capillary proliferation. So this is probably also a uh, kind of a cellular uh, hemangioma. It's not uh, really have the granulation tissue-like reaction that we see with the pyogenic granulum, but there's a lot of overlap between those two entities. Uh, the most important thing is just to make sure you're not missing the diagnosis of anything that's, that's more unusual. But these are all small, typical appearing blood vessels. Um, a couple of them have a little bit of a prominent endothelial cell lining to them over here. Um, could this be, you know, maybe a little bit of a histiocytoid hemangioma or something like that? Possibly that one blood vessel is a little bit large. Um, it's certainly not angio lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia because there's no real inflammation or any eosinophils. And it's got these large sort of dilated cavernous areas here. So it's probably, once again, a uh, just a cellular variant of a hemangioma that may have been traumatized. Now, we're not uh, getting into today the um, whole business of the pediatric um, vascular tumors. That's an entirely different um, category, but there is a stain, GLUT1 stain, that we use to distinguish between uh, these, uh, these angiomas that can develop in, uh, in children. And you can see whether they're gonna be lesions that are more likely to be proliferative or they're gonna be able to possibly more likely regress. So I would recommend that you review that topic. It is something that does get uh, tested on every now and then on the, on the examinations. Uh, and it's important to know, uh, if you just look at the morphology of those lesions from a histologic perspective, they can all look pretty much just like we're looking at right here, or even like you know, possibly a traumatized hemangioma. So you can't always use the morphology to help you there. You really have to use the stain, the age that it's developing in the patient, whether it's present at birth or whether it's developing shortly after birth. Uh, and then uh, it's really almost used more of a, as a prognostic indicator as to whether the lesion may progress more aggressively or, or possibly regress. So um, that's the, uh, the concept of the, uh, the, the pediatric hemangiomas, pediatric vascular neoplasms. The, and then there's the niche and the rich and those things. So I'm not going to go over all those now. That's really more kind of a pediatric dermatology uh, lecture. But I would recommend that you familiarize yourself with that, uh, that whole concept. All right, this is another uh, hemangioma or a variant of a vascular lesion. And notice here, we're dealing with a lesion that is um, fairly deep in the skin. So we've got these very large um, ectatic blood vessels, much larger than the small capillary-like blood vessels that we see here. And so we see something like this. Um, this would be maybe more consistent with either a cavernous hemangioma uh, or possibly a variant of, of one of the vascular malformations. And that's another uh, topic again that when you get into trying to distinguish between say a vascular malformation versus a he hemangioma, that's another situation where you can uh, resort to uh, possibly using some special stains and things like that, and also imaging studies to see how deep these lesions go. But when you're looking at these these lesions that have a very large uh, 
uh, blood vessel associated with them like you see here. Uh, from a histologic perspective, we'll often just refer to these as, uh, as an hemangioma with features of a cavernous hemangioma. So if you just had this area up here, uh, this probably, this looks pretty similar to what we've shown you before. It's kind of got a lobular capillary proliferation. But in the other areas, you've got these very large blood vessels here, these large cavernous uh, areas. And then at this one that I showed you before uh, on the, this other piece up here, it's really got a very, very large vascular channel here. So we would sign something like that again, just as a morphologist looking at this as an as a hemangioma, but it's got features suggestive of a cavernous hemangioma, which basically means it's got these larger cavernous like vascular spaces as opposed to these just purely small capillary like spaces to them. Okay, we'll look at uh, the next one here. And uh, this is uh, case number five. Again, notice here we've got these very large uh, ectatic blood vessels here. And these are also down in the deeper part of the dermis. And so, uh, uh, again, this, this looks more kind of like a, these larger blood vessels that are channeled. And, and this one's really more kind of pure large blood vessels. If you just had one or two of these, say, on the lip of someone or on someone's ear, uh, it might fit better in with, say, like a, a venous lake, which is a, a type of vascular neoplasm as well. But here, so we, it's almost like we've got, you know, maybe a hundred little venous lakes that have all kind of uh, clustered together. Uh, each one is lined by thin endothelial cells. We don't have any large, dilated, thick wall blood vessels like you might see, say, with a like a histiocytoid hemangioma or a cavernous hemangioma or anything like that. Here we're dealing with, with these large channels. So this again would look more like possibility of more of a cavernous uh, like hemangioma. So this uh, uh, is another example again, and, and just looking at it from the standpoint of a morphologist, uh, we're just gonna sign something like this out as an hemangioma with features of cavernous like morphology, given that there are these large vascular channels here. So, Cellular hemangioma with some cavernous features in the previous lesion. Uh, if we go back to the number three case over here, a uh, lesion that's kind of got the more cellular morphology to it with cells that are almost kind of histiocytoid. Uh, so again, a lobular capillary proliferation with these larger cells that are uh, prominent endothelial cells, almost looking a little bit like uh, what you can see with angio lymphoid hyperplasia, but without any of the eosinophils. So we might refer to a lesion like this as a histiocytoid hemangioma or an epithelioid hemangioma. Then uh, this number four, which got kind of a cavernous plus a cellular component. And then this last one that really looks maybe more like kind of a these large caverns, these channels of blood vessels in here without any real prominent endothelial cell proliferation. So these are all in a spectrum. They're all benign. Um, from a clinical perspective, they can all look the same. Um, the uh, lesions that are the histiocytoid hemangiomas, uh, they can all, again, it can occur on the head and neck area, especially if they are associated with the eosinophils and the lymphoid infiltrate, like we see with uh, angial lymphoid hyperplasia. But these can occur, they can all look pretty much just like these purplish lesions that are seen anywhere on the body. And sometimes you see like a port wine stain, and then you'll get some vascular proliferations that start developing in those. You get these papillary lesions. And when you biopsy those, they can look like this. Uh, they can look kind of just like a garden variety cherry hemangioma. They can look kind of like uh, a uh, more of a histiocytoid hemangioma. So you really don't know exactly what those blood vessel uh, neoplasms are going to look like until you biopsy them. The good news is that they're, they're all benign. They have very, very low risk of developing into uh, angiosarcoma. But uh, basically, they can all kind of look uh, analogous to what we're looking at, like in this case over here. Now, this is another situation where um, this, this occurs really in two different settings. This is uh, what we refer to as intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia, or a Massan's uh, lesion. And Massan was a uh, French uh, pathologist years ago that actually uh, had his name appended to another number of different things. There's a Massan type of melanocytic nevus. And there's this lesion, the so-called Massan's vascular lesion, which uh, the other name is intravascular inside blood vessels, papillary, these are little papillary vessels here with inside the blood vessels, endothelial hyperplasia. So intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia, 
which is uh, basically what we think happens here. It's analogous to an intravascular pyogenic granuloma. This is kind of a more characteristic area. So what we think happens in a lot of these is that a patient has a normal blood vessel or maybe has a pre-existing hemangioma. It gets traumatized. There's a clot that develops within that. And then you get a pyogenic granuloma-like reaction that occurs when the lesion is kind of trying to undergo um, try to heal. So it's almost kind of like an organizing thrombus that instead of just a clot that then kind of gradually dissolves and, and gets inflamed and goes away, it actually produces this blood vessel uh, lesion that you see here that looks like a pyogenic granuloma. So if we just saw this in high magnification, that's what you would call it. You say, well, this looks just very much like the first slide you showed us. It's got the lobular capillary proliferation. It's got kind of an edematous stroma. It's got a little bit of inflammation in it. Uh, and this would be pretty classic for a pyogenic granuloma. But then you look over to the side, you've got this area where there's been a blood clot here. And then you look more carefully and there's a large blood vessel in which this entire process is sitting in this in lumina. So again, this is uh, a benign process. Um, it's not malignant. You, know, you may occasionally see a couple of mitotic figures and whatnot, but usually they're few in number. And if they are present, they're not really strikingly atypical. So you just have to know, uh, know that this is a benign process that basically is usually precipitated by trauma. And it usually uh, occurs in an area where there's been some ectatic blood vessels. We see these uh, very commonly on the extremities. Uh, they may be seen in somebody say that has a varicose veins, for example, in the lower leg, and maybe they get injured and then they get a nodule that develops there and uh, do a biopsy of it and shows this kind of morphology. So uh, it's a pretty characteristic lesion and something that you should know about and should be aware of. Pretty straightforward histology uh, and the clinical is pretty straightforward. And you know this is be something that theoretically could be tested on on an exam. They might show you a slide of this and expect you to be able to distinguish this say from an angiosarcoma or from Kaposi sarcoma or from anything like that. And the next one, uh, there's another one that I think is important, and uh, I was tested on this back in, in my board, so I know if they tested it back in the 1980s, they're going to test it uh, potentially today. Uh, and you can see this is a, a shave biopsy of a papular lesion, and it's got these blood vessels that are small, they're round. They're often associated with this pink hyaline-like um, stroma surrounding the individual blood vessels, and then overlying it, there's this epithelial hyperplasia that kind of almost looks verrucous and warty. These lesions generally tend to be you know, kind of well circumscribed. They almost have kind of a ball and claw like morphology at the edge of them, like you see here. And uh, occasionally you'll get some little tiny clots within inside these blood vessels. But this is a nice example of an angiokeratoma. And uh, as you know, there's several different settings of angiokeratoma. There's the uh, the Mabelli type, there's the Fordyce type, and then there's the widespread type that can be associated with a number of different uh, systemic illnesses. Um, probably the most common of those that we have to know about, obviously, is Fabry's disease. You get multiple angiokeratomas. They get uh, intestinal involvement with lancinating pains internally. And then there's a couple of other entities, I think fumarate hydratase deficiency, and there's about two or three other metabolic syndromes that are associated with uh, angiokeratomas. So I would strongly recommend that you learn those and know the uh, type of genetic uh, transmission of those diseases as well, because that's something the board examination would very well ask you about. If there's any type of uh, tumor that's associated with a syndrome, especially if it's a metabolic process that's got a genetic abnormality, a biochemical abnormality, you can pretty much take it to the bank that you're going to get a question or two on that somewhere on the exam. And there's a lot of different ways they could, could do that. They could show you the slide like this, expect you to quickly make the diagnosis of an angiokeratoma, and then ask you which disease um, is this entity most likely associated with. And they could ask you one of these various syndromes, or they could say which of the various syndromes has not been associated with these. And they might put a couple of those that are like Fabrays and, and, and a few others, and then maybe list something like uh, Muratori. And you should know that angiokeratomas are not associated with Muratori syndrome or Cowden's or something like that. So those were would be kind of the questions if I were gonna be a diabolical uh, test writer, 
that I would actually consider writing something like that. And it would test you in two to three different ways. So just make sure that you know how to recognize this lesion. It's distinct from a regular garden variety hemangioma because it's got the, the overlying epithelial hyperplasia. It's usually a relatively small lesion like you see here. Uh, they might show you a clinical photograph. Um, these things are usually you know, purplish to black in color. They've been link, uh, likened to uh, a caviar because they kind of look like little small, uh, little black dots on the skin and they're all, you know, filled with blood vessels. So uh, basically just recognize angiokeratoma and the diseases that are associated with angiokeratomas. Okay, we're going to shift gears now and we're going to look at some uh, other blood vessels. And again, this is not a comprehensive uh, lecture of every vascular entity. So I would strongly recommend that you, uh, you know, go back and look at uh, acroangiodermatitis of Molly, for example, which is a, a severe manifestation of stasis alteration, where you get lots of stasis altered blood vessels that form these clusters and tufts of blood vessels in the skin. It can simulate an angiomatous process, or it can also simulate Kaposi sarcoma sometimes. Um, Poems syndrome, where they get circulating uh, anti, they get circulating IgG, IgM pair of proteins that then plug the blood vessels into secondary lobular capillary proliferation around those areas that are ischemic. So I would recommend learning about those also. Those are, those are not vascular neoplasmas per se, but they're vascular proliferations. And now we're going to look at this lesion, which is not a typical uh, angioma. It's a blood vessel tumor but notice that it's got relatively few erythrocytes in the lumen, and it's got these thin, thin, very thin walled uh, vascular channels here lined by endothelium, very, very thin endothelial cells here with these valves here that are floating into the, uh, the lumen here of the, uh, the blood vessel here, that, or the, actually it's not a blood vessel, it's a lymphatic channel. So this is a lymphangioma. Okay, lymphangioma. So look for valves, valves commonly seen in lymphangiomas and very, very thin endothelial lining is very characteristic. And there's two types of lymphangioma that we deal with in dermatology. One would be this type of lesion, which you can see is a pedunculated lesion or a sessile lesion that's got a verrucous epithelial um, hyperplasia to it lined by these very thin endothelial cells with relatively few erythrocytes. Usually there are some erythrocytes, but usually relatively few. And uh, this would be what we would see, we expect to see in a lymphangioma circumscriptum. And we just talked about caviar for uh, angiokeratomas. For this, frog spawn is the other name. So they look like little uh, small, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen frog spawn, if you go down to the uh, to your local pond in your park and, you, and there are frogs there in the spring or in the summertime and you see they lay their eggs, you, they, they look like little bubbles. They look like little small, uh, almost like foam, if you will. And in the skin, they look like the same kind of things. They're little clear blood, little uh, small blebs in the skin. They usually don't have any uh, red blood cells in them, so they look, they look clear and they look like little bubbles. You know, a lot of times dermatologists will biopsy these and send it in as rule out of blistering disease roulette pemphigoid or something like that. And it's not pemphigoid, it's not a blistering disease, it's really a lymphangioma and it's lymphangioma circumscriptum. Circumscriptum, they're usually in these clusters. This is a, uh, a hamartomatous process of the lymphatic vessels. And then the other setting where we see uh, a lymphangioma is a lymphangioma that's deeper, a so-called cystic hygroma. And those are often seen in infancy, they're often seen as a deep subcutaneous like lesion. They're often really more kind of deep dermal rather than purely subcutaneous. And they're often seen in the head and neck area. When the kid cries, it sort of swells up a little bit. Uh, so that's uh, the other setting where we see a lymphangioma. And then sometimes we just see marked lymphedema. Uh, usually when you see massive lymphedema, that's not purely the lymphatics that are involved. Sure, the lymphatics are partially involved. But you'll also see stasis alteration and a lot of edema of the stroma. So it doesn't look anything like this when you get lymphedema. You may get some dilatation of the uh, lymphatic channels, but relatively limited. It's usually more stasis altered blood vessels with a lot of uh, lymphatic sort of extravasation into the, uh, into the dermis and into the stroma. So that's, that's lymphangioma. And that would be a pretty classic example of a 
a lymph uh, lymphangioma circumscriptum. Now, this lesion, occasionally you'll see kind of a, uh, an overlap between a lymphangioma and a hemangioma. And, you know, clinically uh, in those settings, we, we often will just sign it out as a lymph hemangioma. So, uh, so here's one that does have quite a few extravasated red cells in the lumen. It's got some, uh, some little valves here also. It's got some features that look like a hemangioma, and then it's got other areas that look more like a lymphangioma. So there could be some overlap between these lesions as well. The lymphatics and the blood vessels, we all know that they do um, connect with one another and they talk to one another. So it shouldn't be altogether surprising that occasionally we get kind of a combination hybrid lesion where there are features of both a lymphangioma and a hemangioma. And clinically, these will look a little more reddish or purplish as opposed to just being clear uh, like a lymphangioma circumscriptum will. So that's lymphangioma with features of hemangioma, so-called lymph hemangioma. Um, there are special stains that can be done to, to look at the lymphatic differentiation, so-called D240 uh, is the characteristic stain or podoplanin. That's the one that's commonly used. There's also some cross-reaction with sebaceous differentiation that we use for, for that uh, marker. But uh, that's a good stain for staining uh, lymphatics. And then if you're going to stain uh, the blood vessels, uh, things there like factor eight, CD31, uh, ERG, ERG, which is fairly new vascular marker that's been uh, released in the last few years. And then also we do uh, CD34 will highlight the blood vessels. So those are some things that we're actually looking to stain the blood vessels um, themselves. Okay. I'm going to shift gears now and we're going to look at uh, a malignant neoplasm of blood vessels. And uh, here you see a, a slit-like vascular proliferation with these irregular jagged blood vessels. There's an infiltrate of lymphocytes and plasma cells and uh, there's a lot of extravasated erythrocytes as well. And we may be able to see in a couple of areas some pre-existing blood vessels around which are these um, irregular jagged, bizarre blood vessels. And this is a nice example of Kaposi's sarcoma in this case. Now, there are several different uh, subtypes of Kaposi's sarcoma. There can be um, basically a uh, patch, plaque, nodular tumor. So this would be more kind of a plaque-like lesion. Um, this one's actually got almost more kind of an angiosarcoma-like morphology. And uh, we do see that on occasion. There is a so-called angiomatous KS that can kind of look a little bit like this. Um, so this is uh, an example of uh, probably a plaque stage of Kaposi sarcoma in this situation. I think this came from uh, an individual. I, I don't recall if this person had HIV positivity or not. We know that's probably the most common setting where we see KS. And some other things that can help you um, is if you see these little lymphoplasmacytic aggregates, if you see extravasated erythrocytes, you see these little hyaline globules. Those are all things that are pretty characteristic of, of Kaposi sarcoma. So uh, this would be more of the plaque stage of KS, but notice that there really are, are three different stages. There's a, you know, so-called uh, patch, plaque, nodule, and tumor stage of, of KS. So here's another uh, area of that just to kind of look at in, in comparison and contrast. Now let's take a look at, uh, at this case, which was uh, biopsied three different times. And one of the reasons I like to show this is because it demonstrates that uh, this entity in particular, which is an angiosarcoma, can be very subtle depending upon how you biopsy it. And uh, here we've just got all these kind of relatively bland appearing large dilated blood vessels lined by these thin endothelial cells. And if you just saw something like this, you really wouldn't be all that concerned about it and say, hey, this might just be something like uh, an angioma or maybe like a venous lake taken by punch technique, which is not really the best technique, but they were doing kind of uh, scouting biopsies. And here's another area where they got a little bit more cellularity. And you can see there's a little bit more of the vascular proliferation here. And then finally, in the last slide, they actually got into the meat of the matter and they got this obvious, very poorly differentiated uh, neoplasm with all of these very atypical cells with mitotic figures and very bizarre looking, obvious malignant lesion. And then Overlying it, you can see the blood vessels that are regular with the very large hyperchromatic endothelial cells with endothelial cells falling freely into the lumen of the blood vessels. That's almost pathognomonic uh, 
for an angiosarcoma. So if you to see something like that with these kind of irregular blood vessel channels up here with these atypical endothelial cells floating freely into the lumen of these blood vessels, that's really pretty, that's classic for an angiosarcoma. So uh, this kind of shows you the pitfalls of biopsying angiosarcoma. We'll go back up and take a look at these again. So if you just had this, um, again, you'd be very, very hard pressed without any really good clinical information. Here we might, we would be suspicious if we saw something like this, but notice this is a very well differentiated area of the angiosarcoma. So angiosarcomas can be very well differentiated. They can be poorly differentiated. They can be epithelioid looking very much like a squamous cell carcinoma. They can be more spindle in shape where they can simulate things like a, uh, uh, an atypical fibrosanthoma sometimes or uh, pleomorphic dermal sarcoma or, or other types of sarcomas. Um, and they can be of intermediate differentiation. So there can be several different patterns of angiosarcoma and you really have to have a high index of suspicion. And, and I really would recommend if you're dealing with something like this, you might wanna take a clinical photograph when you submit it. Um, I would recommend if you really think it might be an angiosarcoma to do an incisional biopsy rather than a punch biopsy because of this very phenomenon that we're looking at right here. You biopsy one area, you think, oh gosh, this really looks ugly. It, it's gonna be definitely malignant. And if you just saw this field right here, you would not get back the diagnosis of angiosarcoma. You would get back diagnosis maybe of telangiectasis or vascular atasia, something like that. So this field right here is not diagnostic of angiosarcoma, yet the patient's got a life-threatening, horrible disease that you don't want to miss. So uh, if you, luckily they sampled this area and they were, you know, uh, they were doing scouting biopsies. So they, they biopsied uh, area one that looks you know, again, very bland. This is a, this is an example of what you see in a well-differentiated angiosarcoma with none of those atypical endothelial cells, no floating freely in the lumen. I mean, maybe one or two cells here, but that's not enough to make a diagnosis. And then uh, they sample the other area that's, that's a little bit uh, subtle, but has a couple of us areas where the blood vessels are a little bit atypical at the side. And then they sample this area over here. So um, they probably only needed to sample this area. But um, if they were, you know, trying to get a diagnosis, you know, well, then this is the area that you really want to sample. If they just wanted to maybe kind of try to determine the extent of the angiosarcoma, because we know these lesions are usually very large. Um, they tend to be very poorly circumscribed. And sometimes they just may have some what looks like erythema at the periphery, yet it's still the angiosarcoma. So these things are, are very bad prognosis lesions. Um, we know there's several different settings where they arise. The most common where we see them in dermatology is on the head and neck area, usually of older individuals. And uh, they basically can, um, uh, those, those are just really almost like a death sentence. So they're so large, they're very difficult to treat. You can't treat them with surgical excision. Um, you simply basically have to uh, try using things like brachytherapy and things of that nature. I think there may be a few uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents that have been tried. Some people even tried uh, trying to uh, inject the lesions and try to sclerose them, which is just a palliative measure. Uh, so it's really not a good situation when you get a lesion like that. Um, they're also seen following breast cancer, so-called Stewart-Treves. Um, we see them in people that have chronic lymphedema in other locations, people that get, say, uh, filariasis, things of that nature that live in Africa and whatnot. Um, they can actually get uh, secondary Stuart Treves like angiosarcomas in that setting. And then uh, we see patients that get the so-called post-breast surgery radiotherapy, uh, atypical vascular proliferations, that those can be lesions that may develop into angiosarcoma that are kind of in a very early stage of evolution. So they need to be followed carefully as well. So that's kind of a survey of, of some vascular lesions. There, there are a lot, of, I believe uh, Travis uh, has another lecture on this. So you hopefully be getting some of the other lesions that we're not covering today in that lecture. Um, it's an interesting field. I would recommend that you review uh, slides. I, I think you should, you should know uh, not only just the plaque stage KS lesion we saw about today, but you really need to look at patch, nodule, uh, some of the other variants, the angiomatous forms of KS. So uh, uh, a lot of interesting things about vascular neoplasms and uh, 
Uh, again, you don't have to become a vascular neoplasm expert. There's a lot of vessel uh, vascular neoplasms that have been described, but you do need to know the most important ones that we talked about here and perhaps a little bit more about some of these others. So uh, thanks for your attention. I uh, don't recall what we have on board for next week, but we'll do it again uh, next Wednesday. Take care.